So how do you configure the Switch in standalone mode? Well, there's basically two options. You can use any PC, whether it be a laptop or desktop, and plug it directly into the Switch via an Ethernet cable. And then you can use your favorite browser like Firefox, Safari, Chrome, or Edge to access this via 192.168.0.1. Or you can do it in option my way, option B, which I think is a little bit more simple because you probably already have all the infrastructure you need and you're simply just adding this switch to your network. And what do I mean by option B, right? So you probably already have a router uh, provided either by your ISP or one that you own, or you have a gateway, like in my case, where that also does routing and switching and you just need more ports. So you're looking at something like this so you can add your own access points or cameras or whatever it may be. So that's option B. And that way might sound difficult, but it's actually pretty easy. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that might look like for you at home. First things first, let's go ahead and get our equipment mounted on the rack so we can power it up and then connect it to our gateway provided by my ISP, who is AT&T. Okay, before powering on, I'm just gonna go ahead and plug in my gateway to the switch. And now we're just gonna run power to it and we should be good to go. All right, so now that my switch is plugged into my gateway, which is acting as a router, as well as a wireless access point, I can go ahead and access my switch through that router or my wireless access point wirelessly. So if that's not an option for you, one thing you can always do is plug into the switch directly or you can plug into your router. It shouldn't matter because the way that most home routers and equipment works is that they're set up to be a DHCP server already. And what that essentially means is that any device that's connected to the router will be given an IP address, whether that be a laptop, a switch, or a smart device, whatever it is, it should automatically obtain an IP address. So now that you know that, all we have to do now is figure out, well, what's the IP address that was given from my router to the TP-Link switch? So let's find out. So in order to find the IP address, one of the easiest ways is to log into your router. And most routers um, have an IP address, or at least home routers have an IP address of 192.168.0.1 or 192.168.1.1, but they often do change. So if you don't know already know what that is, there's really not much I can do to help you. But in my case, my gateway uh, slash router's IP address is 172.16.1.254. And now that we're logged into the AT&T gateway, um, there's actually a little section called device list. And then from here, I can see every single device that's connected to it. And right at the top, we can actually see the switch. And I can also see uh, my MacBook Pro. So what I'm going to want to go ahead and do is copy this IP address and just paste this into uh, Firefox and I'm prompted with a login. So the default credentials to log into the switch are admin admin. It's going to ask you to set a new password. I'm just going to create something simple um, for testing purposes, but you should use something slightly more complex and we're logged in. So one of the first things that we uh, are prompted with is just system in information. And um, there are some Interesting settings by default, like device location being in Hong Kong, contact information being tplink.com, and then also we have you know our uptime, as well as the system time, which I guess is kind of way off. Um, one of the first things that I would like to recommend that everyone do is just go ahead and disable Telnet because Telnet is very old and insecure. Um, if you do need access uh, to your um, switch, you can, of course, plug directly into it via Ethernet or a console port. But if you really must have remote access uh, for whatever reason, you can enable SSH. That would be the preferred method. But I would just go ahead and disable uh, both, uh, especially in a home situation. Okay, so now that we've disabled that and we're back at the system summary screen, let's go ahead and update some of the rest of this information here. If we click on device um, description, we're gonna change device location to, in my case, SPX Labs. You could type in home here or really whatever you want. System contact, you don't need to change this, but I'm going to just, just because, it makes me feel cool. And let's go ahead and update the time. So this one's kind of important uh, because without a good time, really weird things begin to happen. So 
I'm on central time, so I just need to scroll around here to find central. And I'm gonna leave the rest of the default settings, but if you have a man, if you have an NTP server that you're running at home, or if you know one that you'd rather use, you can update any of these fields here and configure it like that. We'll go ahead and hit apply. And then we should see the time change um, to 12, 11, which by the way, it's actually 1, 11, so it's an hour behind. But that's okay because they've given us the option for daylight savings time. So we're just gonna go ahead and enable this, click apply. And now if we go back to system time, we should see that it is correct. So 1300 hours is uh, 112, so this is fine. We'll leave it like this. Now let's say you wanna update your switch. So this is kind of important, especially if you're not using um, the Amada controller. So what we're gonna wanna do is go ahead and click save so we don't lose any of our settings. And this might take a moment depending on the number of settings that you've changed. And what that does is that saves our configuration file so that when we update the firmware of the switch, we don't lose anything. And that's very important to do uh, when you're using the switch. So if we go down to system tools, we'll see boot config, restore config, backup config, and firmware upgrade. So we're gonna wanna do a firmware upgrade. So let's go ahead and just copy the name of our switch and go ahead and note what hardware version we're on. So we're on hardware version one, sometimes it'll be two, three, who knows what other hardware versions may uh, come out in the future. So we're just gonna remember that it's hardware 1.0. We're gonna paste in that and do a firmware download search. That should take us straight to TP-Link's website, and it does. And it takes us to the exact switch, version one, because that's currently the only option. We'll click on firmware, and then we'll go ahead and download this. And what we're gonna wanna do is open up that downloaded um, folder using you know, Windows Explorer or file, any kind of file explorer. So it gives us a zip file, and unfortunately we can't really use this just yet. So you'll have to use a extraction tool like 7-Zip, WinRAR, or maybe the built-in Windows um, zipping tool. And we're just gonna wanna unzip this file here, and that gives us a new folder with a .bin um, ex executable, essentially. And that's what we're gonna wanna actually give to TP-Link. So I'm gonna push this off the side because we don't really need it. We're gonna go back to our switch, click on, we're gonna click on browse. We're going to look for that folder that we just unzipped in our downloads directory because that's where it downloaded to and we're gonna up, upload that bin file. And then what we're gonna wanna do is say, reboot the switch using the backup image after upgrading is complete. So that way, um, now that we've saved our configuration, it'll load that configuration and also reboot the switch after it's done upgrading. So this process might take several minutes, so we'll just let this uh, shake and bake, as they say, and I'll uh, cut back to when we're done. All right, update complete. So we should be able to log back in now and we can type in the username, which was admin by default and the password that we set. In my case, it was test. And it looks like all of our settings stuck so far. So that's good. That's exactly what we expected to happen. And now that means we are pretty much free to plug in any device we want into the switch. And one cool thing that you can do while you're in here is actually find out uh, what IP addresses um, of devices that are plugged into the switch. You can find out what those are. Now the way to do that is simply click on the layer three features tab here towards the top. So L3 features, you can click on ARP and this brings up the ARP table. So anything plugged in the switch, you will see the IP address for. In this case, you can see the IP address for my gateway, which is 172.16.125. And then also for my MacBook Pro, which is 172.16.1.64. Um, so that's pretty cool. Well, that's how you do the initial standalone configuration for the TP-Link switch. It was pretty straightforward. Now, there are a lot more advanced options that you can do in the switch. And unfortunately, uh, it's way over my skill set and not something I'm going to be able to show you guys because setting up the VLANs and all that stuff is actually kind of difficult in my opinion for standalone mode. I would highly recommend getting the ER605 if you plan on doing any serious VLANs uh, or VLAN segregation, whatever it may be. And uh, you probably might also want the Omada controller software as well, whether that be through their hardware, uh, like the OC200, or using the software installed on your laptop PC, uh, whatever it may be, because it would make your life a lot easier. 
uh, in my opinion, of course. Uh, so with all that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed that this video, and I will see you all next time. Peace.